So I really want to kind of ground our discussion first by really centering the people who are most harmed by um, the challenges that we have in policing right now. And so I'm going to kick off the conversation with Ms. Baez. Um, Ms. Baez's son, Anthony, was killed by police officers more than 20 years ago. And I know since then you've also met with a lot of other mothers and survivors of police violence. Can you tell us, um, you know, tell us what happened to your son and also you know, what have you learned since then in your work with other survivors um, uh, who are dealing with this issue? Um, what I've learned is that um, you have to be strong and everything can be crying. That's what I learned. <coughs> and tell the truth. The truth will get you doors open. And um, I tell the mothers that crying, I mean, it is hurting because it's 23, gonna be 23 years and it still hurt me every Christmas when it comes around. I still say, have the same pain like it happened yesterday. But then they tell me, are you mad at the system? I'm not mad at the system. The system is corrupt. I'm mad at the people that work in the system that don't do their job. I'm mad at the people that think because you don't speak the same language, they can abuse you. That's what I'm upset with. And I'm also upset when they could put <coughs> a police officer murdered somebody and the sergeant, the captain, the lieutenant, everybody give a step back and let the ball bounce where it has to bounce. What happened? Well, why aren't you doing your job? If you're the captain, or, or let's, let's put my case. In my case, the police officer that murdered my son had was uh, on parole, was not supposed to have any community, any, any um, contact with the community he was serving because he was an abusive cop already. 15 prior, comp 15, 15 prior assault charges on him already when he got to murder my son. Now what happened to all those charges? Where was all those victims? Who was taking care of them? Who was doing the cases? That's what bothers me. It wasn't that Lavodi murdered my son. It's how did he get to murder my son? How did he do 15 prior complaints? He went in front of the roll call and slapped a lieutenant. He didn't get reprimanded. He went in front of a judge in the courthouse and told the judge that if he didn't do what he said, he was going to get killed. I mean, how could a guy keep on going like that and nobody there. Everybody walked around eggshell uh, when he was around. And I said, why? And then I, I went in, in the roll call in the precinct and I said, well, well, how did he get to this? And they told me because everybody was afraid that the higher up would reprimand them. I said, but how, how can it be? And I said, well, look, only a bullet's going to stop me because I'm going to speak. And though he did seven and a half years, but it wasn't for murdering my son. It was for violating his civil rights. <laughs> so what justice did I get? I mean, I mean, we put a little criminal in jail for seven years, but that's all. He got away with murder. And that's why I'm upset with the judge who knew. He told him, you're not innocent of this, but I have to let you go. So we have judges that don't do their job. We have um, prosecutors that don't do their job. We have, you know, it goes up the chain, and we, that's what we have to stop, the chain, break that chain, where if you're the sergeant that was supposed to be watching Lavodi, where were you when he murdered my son? You were sitting in the car talking with your partner. So what happened to him? I found out five years after that um, he had cancer, so that's why they didn't touch him, so he could get his pension and retire. Five years after, they would have told me that when it happened, I would have said, no, he's going to go now. But I didn't know until five years after that the DA told my husband, you know, like, um, wait, wait five more years, he'll be out. Of, don't worry, he'll be out of the police. And he had cancer. So 
my, what happened to my son? Do you understand what happened to my heart? Because I have a hole that will never be healed. I don't care how much money they give me. I don't care how much street naming they do. That is never going to heal me. Yes, I got the street name after my son. Yes, I know I, my, my kids and, and his wife, because he did have a wife. Be, a lot of people forget that the wife is the one in charge. Um, he did have a wife. So, yes, they got money. I signed, uh, I don't want no money because I was so mad. And they said, but if you sign, if you don't sign, then you can't, you can't talk about it. I said, if I don't sign, I could talk all I want. Yeah. You understand? If I get money, then I can't talk. But my family don't have nothing to do with this. It's me, Iris. I'm the one that's going to talk. I'm the one that's going to do everything. And I'm going to make sure these police officers get what they need. Yet uh, we found another case that he had. He choked another kid. So it was already a little pattern that he had. Uh, he choked another child and um, sent him to the hospital. When the boy complained, he said, they, there was a CCRB with a rubber stamp. And then um, they put his file in the bottom of the cabinet where he was getting dust. Then my lawyer came and I said, look, there have to be more people. We put an 800 number out of there and the results came in by dozens. Even the police was calling me up about complaints. So, you know, I said, though the police, I know they have a hard job. I don't want to be in their shoes, but you can also say that you feel threatened behind a closed door when you don't know what's on the other side. You feel threatened when you see a man with a gun facing you face to face. You don't feel threatened when there's the door closed and you're shooting inside there without knowing what's behind that closed door. So that, those little things is that what bothers me. And I know my God, is, my son is in heaven and I know he's applauding all, you know, all the ones that are doing good because he wanted to be a law enforcement. He took the written test and um, he didn't, he, he had to go back for his physical, but he never got to go and do his physical. So that's why I say all the police officers are not bad, but the ones that stand by and allow the police officer to slap somebody, then you're just guilty as the one that did the slapping. And you're just guilty as the one who did the murder. And you're just as guilty, okay? I know you don't want to lose your job. That I understand. If you talk, you could lose your job. I understand that. But some men got to put on their pants right and say something because, I mean, all these pants are falling all over the place and nobody's doing nothing about it. Okay, God bless. Thank you, Ms. Baez. Um, so, uh, <laughs> a little humor into a no, serious I'm not gonna drop my situation. Pants that. That's good. <laughs> Um, so we were actually, before we got moved up into this room, the next thing we were going to do is actually show a little film clip because Ms. Baez um, was featured with two other mothers whose sons had been killed by police in a movie called Every Mother's Son. Um, and we're not going to show the clip because we don't have the AV possibilities in this room, but I encourage you all to go watch it. And for those of you who are students here at John Jay, you can get it for free on uh, Canopy, which you can, you all have a login to, I'm told. Um, so Every Mother's Son. but. There's a clip, one of the clips we were going to show from the film, um, which is going to be my segue uh, to my next question for you, Ron, is um, there's a police officer who's being interviewed about the, the case, and he says, um, you know, if I was sitting in the patrol car and the football hit my car, I would have gotten out of the car and thrown it back and said, you know, hey, hey, let's play catch instead of killing him, which seems like a good baseline. Um, and he says that's community policing. Um, so, Ron, I want to kind of ask you, right? I think everyone in this room has probably heard a different definition of community policing that was raised earlier in one of the earlier panels as well. Um, talk to us about community policing, and in particular, sort of how do we get beyond some of the more surface level, like coffee with a cop, into like much more meaningful engagement and, and community voice within the process? So, good afternoon, everyone. Wow. Yeah. What you say? So, so, yeah. so with community policing, I, I think someone said it at an earlier panel, that's one of the questions with 18,000 police departments, if you were to ask what it is, you would likely get 18,000 definitions. And because of that, then it's implemented or adopted or sold in many ways. 
So when I was in the Justice Department, we came up with a very short definition that I think applies from a core principle point of view, which is community policing is when the community and the public co-produce public safety. The key word there is the co-production of public safety. What happens with a lot of communities, it becomes community policing becomes a community program or community meetings. If I go to the meeting, that's community policing. If I throw the football, that's community policing. If I have coffee and talk about issues, that's community policing. And to me, those are community programs. That's a component of community engagement, but community policing is the co-production. And in short, what I would tell you as a community member, community policing is the sharing of power to dictate the future of a community, period. That the badge that an officer wears does not belong to him or her. That's not their badge, it's yours. You give it to them to facilitate and to lead the crime fighting strategy, but without your leadership, then it's not community policing, which means the community has to have power, not just at the meeting, but in setting policy, in developing training, in accountability, in crime fighting, Every aspect of policing should have community involvement and quite frankly, community leadership. Outside of that, then all you have is community meetings. And why this is important to what was just said is the challenges we face in policing are too often brought, brought down to couple individual cops. And if it's individual, individual cops in the community doesn't really need to get upset unless that individual cop's not held accountable. And I think you heard the best examples. Our problems are not individual cops. You're always gonna have bad apples in any barrel, we know that. But the bad apple in a barrel kind of equation really undermines the larger issue, which is the barrel itself is rotten. The systems in which we operate were designed in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, and if we're gonna be honest, they were designed for one purpose and one purpose only, to oppress communities of color, to enforce Jim Crow laws, and to hold people of color down and contain their activities in their neighborhoods. That's the criminal justice system as it was designed. You can change the people, and I think we have changed the people, as you have the overwhelming amount of good people that want to do a good job. But if they're operating in these old systems, then even a good cop will have a bad outcome. I will use New York as an example, and I'm looking at Richard Jerome, and I'm not gonna get into your thunder, but let me step in here. We had this big debate in New York about stop and frisk. The argument I would give with that is, the officer didn't decide to do that. They were told to do that. The system required that they do that, and for some, if you didn't do it, not only did you do it, didn't do it right, then you would not advance inside the police department. These are the system, this is where community policing comes in, because that decision to use stop and frisk or anything like that should have never been limited to the police department. That was a community decision to decide what type of enforcement activities it will accept, what type of enforcement activities are acceptable, what levels of disparities are tolerable, if any, and if there are disparities, what's the difference between police disparities and social disparities? How much resources do you put in enforcement versus recovery or services or other things? All those are community decisions and absent community policing, it doesn't become that. It becomes you're simply told what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. I then go to a community meeting, tell you how effective it was by telling you how many people I took to jail. And then by the way, Saturday, I got a coffee with the cop, so come have some coffee with me. <laughs> That's not community policing. And we have to reject any notion that suggests that. And as you hear the stories about the lack of accountability, that means the system has failed. You've asked a question that I used to always ask as a police chief. If an officer does individual misconduct, conduct, how is it every other part of the system walks? Where's the sergeant, lieutenant, the captain, the police chief that either initiated the program that resulted in it or failed to provide the supervision or saw something before it happened, know it was gonna happen? Right, so this is where I think the community, I say for this group here, as you go back to your communities and talk about community policing, you can talk about it at the meeting, but it has to follow up then with you having some significant power. What good police chiefs will tell you, the more power you give up, the more power you get. That's the number one rule of police management in my book. The more power I give to you as a community member, and I can't give it to you because it's yours to begin with, but the more I recognize that power, the more powerful I become because then we make decisions. We hold people accountable. We decide how to fight crime, and when crime goes up, we fight it together. Not I, not me, I'm not the savior of a city. I'm not determining what the course is gonna be like for a thousand black men that get stopped every day inside of a community. We decide how we're going to do it. And if we decide that we're gonna invest in re-entry, re, re, re 
then we've made that decision. Then my role is to help facilitate that. So I would say community policing is probably the most misused phrase in the country. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, even the academia will misinterpret this one. And it drives me crazy where they'll do a study and says, community policing against policing. How could there be a separate one? We went looked at the community programs versus enforcement. Well, enforcement is a part of community policing. Deciding to enforce, how to enforce, why to enforce, what kind of impact it's gonna have should be driven by co-production of public safety. And if you focus on public safety and not crime, then I'm gonna paraphrase a Dr. King phrase, public safety cannot just be the absence of crime, it must include the presence of justice, mm -hmm. which means how you fight crime matters, <clears throat> the residual impact matters, the collateral damage matters. To argue that something works when you're basically incarcerating 10% of an entire <clears throat> population or disrespecting them matters. We have to start doing the kind of cost-benefit analysis and making the decisions what's in the best interest of our community. So a long answer saying community policing, please take it beyond the issue of community meetings. It is great when chiefs want to meet with you, but you need much more than that. You want to share their authority, their power, and just never forget the badge that the officers are wearing do not belong to the officer. You gave them that badge to represent you. You're the one that empowers them. And there's an old saying we have with Sir Robert Peel, and I close with this, is that we call the father of modern day policing, is that the police are the public and the public are the police. And so they're supposed to be one and the same. We're just the ones that get paid to focus on it 24 hours a day. It doesn't mean that we're the ones that are solely responsible, nor does it mean that we're supposed to be the ones with all of the power. It means that we work for you, we're a part of you, you get to drive that agenda, but you have to demand your seat at that table. Thank you so much. Um, so my next question is to Randy and uh, to DA Gonzalez, if you each wanna, you know, I'd love to hear, um, like what are some concrete examples that you've either seen or that you would like to see about, you know, what Ron is talking about, giving real voice to the community in policing? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Okay. I think, it, I, I can't get away with just saying ditto to what Ron said. I, he, he covered a lot. Uh, but what I, I think what's missing, where Ron started to go with that, is we have a lot of accountability mechanisms for police, probably more than any other profession, right? They have, they have administrative sanctions, you know, the lowest end of that, that can be uh, anything from training to counseling to, uh, suspension to termination. Then we have state and federal criminal charges that can be filed on a police officer for criminal conduct. Then we have state and federal civil uh, sanctions that can also occur. So there's a whole bunch of mechanisms for holding police accountable, but all of them are on the back end, right? It's, it's after something really bad happened or, or something not really bad, but bad. So that, that's when all of the accountability mechanisms <coughs> kick in. They do nothing on the front end. Um, the policing project, which you're probably familiar with, uh, has been doing some studies, and I'm going to butcher her name, so I apologize in advance, but uh, Dr. Maria Panamarenko and Dr. Barry Friedman um, have been doing studies on just that. How do we get this front end accountability, which is exactly what Ron was talking about. How do we engage the public, get the public engaged in the development of policing policy, right, right, at, the, right at the forefront of it. Um, I had a, a deputy chief of mine when I was a young police officer who had said something I had never heard in the academy or before this. He, he was big on instructing use of force. He was very serious about, um, you know, he felt that the government using force is the most intrusive thing the government can do to you. Okay, so he was very, uh, careful with it, he, we trained on it a lot, he taught about it a lot, he was an expert witness on it. But one of the things he said is that policing is a privilege. He said it's a privilege given to you by the community that you serve. And I had never heard that before, um, and, and we don't really hear it a lot since. Ron, Ron's one of the few people that's really mentioned it in that, in that light that I've heard recently. Um, but that's an important thing because it gets to the fundamentals of, of uh, community policing, and again, there's, there's a lot of definitions of community policing, and we don't, we don't have one that everyone follows. Um, but it gets to the fundamentals of it that policing is a privilege that 
the community gives to the police officers and needs to share in the responsibility of keeping their neighborhoods safe. Um, Sir Robert Peel's statement was absolutely correct. It was our guiding principle that started modern day policing, right? Was that the public are the police and the police are the public. Um, so I, I think that, that the studies that the policing project are doing now are focusing on how to do that, on how to engage the public in policing policy, and then we have something that can be held accountable. I think one of the most destructive incidents for a community's relationship with its police department is that in-between incident that happens, right? That, that they don't understand and that the police can't really explain because it didn't go all the way on the completely justified spectrum, right, where we look at it and say, of course the police officer had to do that. What was, what was his or her choice? He had no choice in the matter. And it doesn't go on the other end of the spectrum where we say, wow, that was so far out of line. That, that's murder, right? It's somewhere in between. And the most destructive part is when it's legally justified but still reprehensible. And, and then we have this, this tension, right? Because there's no mechanism now to hold the police accountable for it in the public's eye, but the public is resentful of what happened, even though it wasn't illegal. Now, how do we get rid of that middle ground? Well, we can change that middle ground by having the public have a say in how they're policed so that there is a function to address those issues when it when it's something that is bad but doesn't rise to the level of a state statute or a, or a constitutional violation or something like that um, we can we have this function that hopefully prevented that from happening because the public said this is how we want to be policed you know maybe maybe the Maybe the community doesn't want harsh, strict uh, traffic enforcement, right? Where there's, there's constant radar being run um, and people are just getting hammered for, for tickets. Maybe that's not what they want. Shouldn't they have some sort of say in what the enforcement priorities are, as Ron was saying? You know, a, a chief of police like Ron was, where he steps up and says, I want the community's say in this. What, what are the things that affect your quality of life and how do you want to be policed? Then we don't have things like stop and frisk, like Ron was saying. Then we don't have things where people are losing their driver's license because they can't afford to pay a traffic ticket. And then now their license is suspended and they can't get, not only can they not get to work, but they're getting arrested for driving their car to try to get to work, right? You see how, the, how these things can snowball into much bigger problems. So. I guess getting rid of that, that middle area, right? Because like Ron said, we're gonna have individual incidents that are really bad, and we deal with those. We're gonna, have really, we're gonna have incidents that the police are gonna need the community support because they had to do something and it, it was justified and the community backs them on it. It's that middle ground where it's, it's repulsive to look at, to, to see it, but it wasn't illegal. I think that's the hardest part to address, but we can address it at the front end because there is no mechanism for that at the back end right now. Good afternoon. Uh, let me start off by acknowledging uh, Ms. Baez for her courage to come and, you know, so many years, you know, after the death of her son, continuing to fight for him. And um, that you know, advocacy, uh, advocacy of, of her and other mothers and other family members to speak to people who have lost their lives or have been victims of police brutality is such an important component. Um, for myself, as a young person growing up in the city, um, I remember when Anthony was killed, I was still in school um, back then. I mean, I remember the anger that I felt as a Puerto Rican male um, that he was, you know, murdered and choked to death. Um, regardless of what, you know, the autopsy said, that it might have been a heart condition, there might have been other things that played into it, the, the anger that our communities feel when uh, the people that are meant to protect us um, cause us 
to lose our lives for things that seem very trivial at that time. Um, and growing up in East New York, it was one of those kind of situations for me. Um, my background growing up as, you know, f fairly poor. My parents are from Puerto Rico. I was born here. But growing up in a poor community, um, watching and living in a high crime community. I lived in East New York in the 70s and 80s, um, within the 90s. It was a neighborhood with a lot of crime. And I remember very clearly being afraid as a young boy growing up in that neighborhood. Uh, but I also did not find solace um, in the policing practices um, in our community and feeling that um, the police were not a solution for us. You know, So what did most young people my age do? They joined gangs because that's how we protected each other from other bad guys. And we didn't really rely on the police to protect us. Um, coming from that background, I made an interesting decision. I, I made the decision to try to become a prosecutor because I thought there had to be a way to make our community safer, but a community um, that really needed to have fundamental fairness in the way we were policed. And so I echo um, the conversation because as Brooklyn, over the last few years, has continued to lead the city in, in, in terms of getting safer, um, when I'm in communities, um, it's not enough that people believe that their neighborhood is getting safer, and it's not enough that they believe that the system is becoming, f you know, that the system is more fair. They actually have to feel it. They have to feel the sense of fairness and safety and it's still lacking in most communities of color. It's still lacking the sense that I can get a fair shake, whether I'm accused of a crime or I'm a victim of a crime. The system does not care about me or my people. Um, and so as the district attorney uh, of Brooklyn, newly elected this November, I made the decision that the first thing that I was gonna do is create Justice 2020 which was my effort to do exactly what we've been talking about. We've been talking about community policing, but I view it as the district attorney doing this job with the community. And asking the people of Brooklyn, what does safety look like? How do you want the laws to keep us safe? And what does fairness look like? And so Justice 2020, I was fortunate enough to get over 70 criminal justice experts, reformers, um, academics, law enforcement, service providers, people who've been incarc formerly incarcerated folks, the clergy, stakeholders, to get into a room and say, think about a blueprint of what justice should look like and how we can involve the community in making our community safer, but really focusing on strengthening trust in our justice system. And they gave me a bunch of recommendations. Um, we are putting together about 17 recommendations that I'm committed sort of as a report card to say that over the next few years, these are the things my office is gonna work on doing um, to make our criminal justice system not only a, a system that makes us safer, but makes our system one that we can believe in, one that we have trust in, and one that we feel we can get justice. And the issue of police accountability, obviously, is one of the recommendations that has come forward. How do we do that? Um, and for me, part of it is that fundamental question of saying, what do we want from our police? What do we want in terms of going about and getting you know, an understanding of what safety looks like in our community and not being dictated by the district attorney or the one PP um, saying this is what we're going to do to keep you safe, but actually having those conversations in the community saying what do you want? And so one of the things that very recently um, I've done, my office has done, is we announced that we weren't gonna prosecute most marijuana cases. But we also went a step further and said that we were going to start to vacate prior convictions that people have had for marijuana, over 20,000 people just in Brooklyn. And that, and that comes from an understanding of communities that says these former policies that your office, DA, 
prosecuting these cases and the police department making these arrests have harmed our community. We don't want that. We don't believe it kept us safer. In fact, we know all the collateral consequences that this level of enforcement has have had on our communities, especially communities of color. And so we're doing things differently. I'm putting together advisory panels now in Brooklyn to help me um, figure out how we keep our community safe, but in ways that people believe that there's actually fairness and that they can trust this justice system. So I'm echoing what was said, but I think it's the first time that you've ever seen the DA's office say it's not just you know, community policing, it's what a district attorney needs to do to share his power or her power with the community to make sure the way we enforce the laws in our courthouse are re actually represent what the folks that we serve want. Um, so Barry, I'm gonna turn to you now, and if you could maybe, I know you've been thinking about this question in terms of transparency, if you could talk to us a little bit about that. Sure, first I know that you're gonna keep those promises because uh, <clears throat> we were working on a case and uh, uh, we had a talk and, they, and uh, Eric's staff said, oh, you gotta go to the temple in Park Slope, that's where he is, so we could made a, make a date to meet the next day. And he got up and he said, I'm gonna do all these things and I promise uh, and uh, you can hold me to the promises. And a woman rabbi got up in that temple at Park Slope and said, and we're gonna hold you to each and every one of them. So I would never <laughs> wanna go back there unless you did everything. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to talk briefly about uh, an issue that I, I think Carol Act, uh, Bogart at the beginning, remember she said that uh, one of the key things in the criminal justice system is to wrest from it the secret data. And one uh, issue that has come to my attention, and the attention of a lot of people in the defender community, the prosecutorial community, uh, is adjudicated acts of misconduct by police officers uh, uh, actually are kept secret in so many places across the country, particularly this city and this state, and uh, until recently, as I'll describe the state of California. So let me show you the first slide. Uh, this, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, this is a, a slide that was uh, put together by <clears throat> National Public Radio that looked at this issue and began uh, looking at all the jurisdictions in the country to see where an adjudicated act of misconduct by a police officer would be a public record that a citizen or a journalist or a member of the community could go and file a Freedom of Information Act request and see if they could find it, all right? And in 23 states, uh, it was confidential and could not be gotten through a Freedom of Information Act or a Open Record Act, whatever you call it in your jurisdiction. It used to be 23 states. California just changed it. They're now 20, it's now 22. And why did California change it? Well, uh, they actually had the worst statute in the United States. Not even prosecutors mm -hmm. could get access to adjudicated acts of misconduct. And here I'm talking about uh, internal affairs, uh, if you have a civilian complaint review board, um, if you collect all the uh, <clears throat> civil cases that are settled, um, if you have findings uh, by judges or others that an officer uh, did not tell the truth in a courtroom or engaged in an act of excessive force and made that a finding in a proceeding. Uh, can you get this data? Is it all in one place? Well, in California, the Sheriff's Department in Los Angeles had a list of 300 officers that they found had committed so many acts of misconduct uh, that they put them on what they call a no-call Brady list. And this included officers who put Tabasco sauce on their shirts and said it was blood, who had committed acts of uh, sexual misconduct with civilians, and certainly had lied. And they wanted to give this list to the district attorney's office in Los Angeles. And the unions moved to enjoin them under California law, and they won. And that case is now pending in the California Supreme Court. So in the interim, the legislature finally woke up to this issue and passed a statute uh, that allows uh, public rec personnel file public record of any uh, uh, finding 
uh, having to do with lying or filing a false report. That is now public record in California, will be as soon as Governor Brandt signs the bill. Um, and then people could get access to it with an Open Record Act or an FOIA request, or sexual assault of a woman, or anything having to do with inflicting great bodily harm, death, or, the, uh, or discharge of a weapon. All personnel files in regard to those inc incidents are public records, okay? In New York, uh, I ran into a young woman named Cynthia Conti Cook, who's a public defender at the Legal Aid Society, and I never knew this. She had invented, uh, literally, an app that allows adjudicated acts of misconduct collected by the Legal Aid Society to be put on a cell phone. So now, if you are a legal aid lawyer in New York City, and you walk into court at first appearance, you will see every settled civil case with respect to the officer that arrested your client, everything that comes from CCRB to the extent that that is available or to the extent that legal aid has uh, act, uh, information under protective order about a finding from internal affairs, uh, everything from newspaper articles written about the police officer. Uh, let's say a police officer was seen on a videotape uh, in some case where they acted improperly or there's a transcript where a judge made a finding that they didn't tell the truth, that's in the database. Um, all of this can be found there. And so when a legal aid lawyer walks into court and sees, oh, officer so-and-so has arrested my client, he or she hits their phone and they see it all, all right? Um, and soon that will be available to every defender office in the city whether it's Bronx Defender, Brooklyn Defender, everyone. And we're gonna then soon get this crowdsourced to people that are part of lawyers, associations, members of the private bar. So what happened? A very interesting thing. Show the next slide. You see this? I call this the virtuous cycle. Uh, I found out about this by attending one of a meeting, one of Cy Vance's meeting with our Conviction Integrity Unit in Manhattan, and he said, guess what? We're gonna be going to court soon, and we're gonna be giving all the civil cases, all the adjudicated acts of misconduct, everything we know bad about these police officers, and just before the trial starts, we're gonna turn this over to the defense. And I turned to my colleagues and I said, what happened this morning? <laughs> Why is this all of a sudden the highest priority? And I don't mean to say that uh, Sire or anybody else there would not want to do this if they had that information. Um, and then I found out, then I meant Cynthia Conti Cook. And the reason, to be honest, that there was this uh, uh, sudden urge to get all this data is that the legal aid lawyers were walking into court and they had it. And they knew more about the, the police officers than the Manhattan District Attorneys, the Kings County District Attorneys, the Bronx, any of them. And so then, uh, uh, Carrie Dunn, Counsel to Cy, uh, uh, wrote a letter to the New York City Police Department that I know Eric and everybody else signed off on, and this letter said, you know, we not only want to know about all adjudicated acts of misconduct and all settled civil cases and everything, which we know you have in a digital file, we want to know about it, not at the end of the case, we want to know about it at the beginning of the case when we're filing the charges so we can make judgments about credibility, bail, everything else. And they wrote that letter to the New York City Police Department, and the New York City Police Department said no. no. Now that can't stand, all right? And it won't stand. Because you, the virtuous cycle is that we had this defender-based database, it then got this data out to the public, to the community, it uh, the prosecutors responded appropriately because they're doing their job and the prosecutors in this city and you're my prosecutor in Brooklyn, they know I have confidence that they're gonna do their job about this. And then in turn, they are pressuring the police department. Now let me tell you about Chicago very, very briefly. Yesterday, I don't, I, uh, Kim left before I could say hello to her or I, don't, I haven't seen her. Yesterday, Kim Fox went into court in Chicago and she vacated 18 convictions. That is now altogether 42 convictions that have been vacated in Chicago based on the activities 
of a Detective Watts, who was a detective gone bad, who was basically dealing drugs in certain housing project areas in Chicago, and if people wouldn't facilitate his dealing of the drugs, he framed them, all right? Uh, now, how many of you have heard of the Invisible Institute? Raise your hand. I don't see too many people raising their hands. And when I talk to some of my colleagues, they say, hey, do you know about them? Well, the Invisible Institute, uh, run by uh, uh, Jamie Calvin, a journalist in Chicago, worked with Craig Futterman, a professor at University of Chicago Law School, they led the way in getting access to adjudicated acts of police misconduct, Calvin versus the city of Chicago. They got access to all this data, it's a very long story, they then did articles exposing Detective Watt because they heard about it from their clients. They wrote articles about Watt. He was well known by everybody, but it took a long time before he was finally indicted and convicted by federal prosecutors. And it's because of that bottom-up information that came, they, the Invisible Institute, have a, you go to their website, invisibleinstitute.org, you'll see a citizen's police database. It's not as good as the legal aid database, but it is a public record database. So now the, dis, the public defender in Chicago is gonna take the Invisible Institute database and add more things to it, and I'm sure Kim Fox is already doing that. I envision if we get the money to do this, and it's very simple because this app costs nothing right, that we should be able to get in real time adjudicated acts of misconduct. I'm not talking about slander or smear. I'm talking about adjudicated acts, findings by judges and by police departments of what went wrong with certain cops. So the police officer that killed your son, you know, if there's a database and you see 15 incidents, people in the community are not going to let that stand, nor will the prosecutors, nor will the police chiefs. This data we can crowdsource this data, we can get it, as was said at the very beginning by our friend from 538. It's data that's in real time, it's like that Philadelphia data, open source. It's, as soon as it happens, it goes right up onto the database. Everybody looks at it. This kind of, this technology is simple. This is not a risk assessment instrument that we all have to worry about how we're gonna collect the data with you know, uh, race effects. We're talking here about facts. And this, is, uh, this was the smartest idea I had heard in a long time. Um, and I'm so pleased that the prosecutors in this city immediately got on it. And we will win that fight with the police department uh, to get these acts. And needless to say, I will end with this. I went on too long. Needless to say, without accountability, without facts, uh, you can't have the co-production of, uh, of justice in a community. What, I was gonna add one thing to the data. One thing you didn't mention, Barry, that was equally important with this data. When the President's Task Force met, there's a recommendation I want you to take a look at, and that is that we expand the use of the National Decertification Index. Yeah. So not only if a, if a cop did a misconduct case in let's say New York and was sustained and was fired by the commissioner. The likelihood of me finding out in California when he applies or she applies for a job with me becomes very hard, depending on how he or she left. If they do resignation in lieu of it, they have accepting discipline with almost non-disclosure agreements. There's all kinds of ways so that you see a cop will start bouncing around from agency to agency, state to state with this record that we don't find out about until they end up shooting and killing somebody, and then it's like, wow, they did the same thing two states over. They were arrested for using racial slurs, and we will never know. So once you get this kind of data, it's not just for the community to, uh, to hold a department accountable, it will help the department hold itself accountable to make sure you don't hire somebody that has that record. And, and I'm trust me when I say this, that number is a very big number of people yeah. that will bounce around these states that will get hired that have been disciplined for other places. Yeah, could even get hired uh, by the New York City Police Office office and uh, choke somebody in Staten Island. Yes, they, they go from, from precinct to precinct. The bad apple here gets shipped to Brooklyn, and from Brooklyn we found uh, a police officer that was bad in Bronx, and then he was in Brooklyn. And then over there, we went over there and picked it, and they fired him from there because they, he did something there. So, and that, with that, um, 
we we started uh, taking um, how many people were getting murdered and the police name in in 1996. So uh, we got a book with names, and I went. We went all over. We went to L.A. We went to San Francisco. Getting people were just calling, calling. Look, I got a picture of my son, and then we started the Stolen Life book, and in 1996, and, and no, yeah, 1996, we started the Stolen Life book, and that has pictures. And then we there were so many that we couldn't, you know, like keep on. We needed the volume two and volume three, and it's still going, you know. And. Thank you. The, so this conversation sort of um, kind of connecting all these threads around the question of acknowledgement, right? You're talking about kind of present day harm that's being covered up. Um, Ron, you talked earlier about, right, there's this history of policing. Policing has upheld slavery. Policing has upheld segregation. How, how can we talk about kind of the acknowledgement of history as a part of accountability? And what would it take to imagine that the institution of policing could actually acknowledge both historical and present day harm? Like what are the barriers, what are the opportunities for that? So I'm going to paraphrase it, I'm going to get it wrong, so don't correct me, but there's a Mandela quote that says, only the truth can heal the past. Mm -hmm. And so I think the idea, if you look at reconciliation, especially racial reconciliation, it has to start with the truth, the acknowledgement. And one of the things I would say that we're making some leeway about two years ago, and Carol Mason, I see Heinrich, you may remember this, at an International Association of Chiefs of Police conference, the president of this association that represents 10, I think 17,000 police chiefs through 100 countries, stood up and acknowledged the role that police have played from a generational point of view, going back to slavery through um, desegregation, through Jim Crow laws, so across the board. And that was the first time that there was an acknowledgement that this was the role that we played. Now, the part that was missing, and that was a huge step he got slammed across the board, but I applaud him because he had the courage, as you would say, ma'am, he put on the big boy pants that day and he did it. So a lot of chiefs are starting that acknowledgement, and I think the key for that is, is that we have to have the acknowledgement, and right, quite frankly, in many cases, the apology. It's hard to forget, ask a community to proceed forward until you at least acknowledge the role it's gonna play. However, I think there's a second part of that equation that we too often don't do. Yes, we contributed to generational discri discrimination and harm, but that would almost suggest that it's not occurring today. There's a second part, which is it is still ongoing today. Mm -hmm. So that acknowledgement and truth has to be there. I can't apologize to what someone wore the uniform 30 years before I was born, but I can apologize mm -hmm. for what my officers are doing today. And I can give you the commitment now, once we acknowledge that, that whether good intentions or not, we're having these terrible outcomes, then we can sit down and figure out solutions to these problems together. I just believe one of the things this country hasn't done, unlike a South Africa, we have not done a racial reconciliation. We keep pretending everything is okay. We had a black president, everything is okay. This race thing, always the race card, you're, play, you're complaining too much, everything's okay. It is not. It is not even close to being okay. And until we can look at each other and say, this is the truth, it's gonna be hard to move past that. There's no program, there's no strategy other than starting with the truth and acknowledging exactly where we came from, and more importantly, where we're at today. Uh, um, there's, a, there's a parent, her name is Hawaba, and her son um, was murdered in his apartment. She called the ambulance, right, and, they, and the squad came. I don't know why the squad came with helmets and everything. They broke into the man's house, and they killed him. Now, they went to court, and she won the case, and now, the city wants to sue, try her all over again, and now they're gonna begin the case all over again after she won the case. And then they took the first judge out and they put another judge. To me, this is like, uh, he had, he's a criminal judge that's gonna take the case now and clean it up because they made a mess, but I'm gonna let the cop go. These cop goes. That's, that's the signal they sent to me. I don't know about anybody else, but that's the way I'm reading it. This new judge is going to clean everything out. Thank you. Um, it, you know, the, the, so the question of accountability has come up, of course, throughout the, the conversation today. And, you know, when we, when we say accountability, what we often mean is 
punishment or even incarceration, right? Convictions, um, particularly in shooting cases. And you know, at the same time, um, in the larger criminal justice space, there's a sort of an ongoing conversation about redefining accountability and starting to think beyond incarceration and punishment as our default kind of go-to um, model of accountability. I'm wondering if there's any way that we can bring that that, that, that newer thinking into this conversation, are there other models of accountability that would be meaningful in the context of policing? And I, I open that to anybody on the panel. Well, clearly, when we talk about accountability for officers, it has to start with the basic premise that no one is above the law, and that accountability obviously means that when officers do wrongdoing, now we're not necessarily talking about these you know, police shootings or the one of the cases that end the fatality, but our officers are often treated differently in the criminal justice system, even as simple as when they get involved in a dispute or an altercation, whether they're on duty or off duty, they're not immediately arrested, they're not immediately treated like any other citizen. And so I think accountability also means for people who are members of law enforcement, when they are responsible for wrongdoing, they have to be held to the same standard as anyone else. And that means that uh, we need to move forward more quickly um, and not just, you know, we see it all the time. Um, because someone's an officer, they're not arrested and they're later able to turn themselves in if a prosecutor is going to bring the charges, but th that the, there's a sense that they're just treated differently and that they're not being held to the same standard. And so for me, accountability also means that uh, my office is focused on cases that when a police officer is involved in misconduct that we're investigating and we're moving swiftly on those cases to make sure that they would be treated like any, any other person. And you know, over the last few years, uh, my office has made a number of cases um, on officers, not just on I issues of brutality, but just uh, we <coughs> indicted someone this year for um, perjuring themselves during the application of a search warrant. We indicted another officer, uh, I think last week, for uh, stealing public benefits. We indicted another officer for stealing another person's home due th deed fraud. And these are cases that traditionally in the past it was a sense that these officers would not be held to the same standard because they had a badge. And, and we are making sure that, at least in Brooklyn, that any officer who commits wrongdoing will be treated just like any of us in this room. Just real quick. Yeah, but just, to, just, just a cautionary, if I may say, the criminal statute is the, is the floor of accountability. Sure. That's about as low as you can go. <laughs> and what you have to demand for any profession is the ceiling. Excellent. Could you imagine, if I told my attorney, provide me the services just good enough not to get disbarred. <laughs> or my doctor, just make sure you give me just enough not to have wrongful death. But you want is the best in the industry. So even though the shooting may be lawful, but if it is awful, then as a chief, I have accountability to say, you know what? The DA can't charge you, but your decision making, how you proceed it, is not what I want. Your services are no longer needed. And remove that person from service. So we can't measure accountability by how many officers get indicted. That's but one figure. Not to exclude that. It also means the standards we set, that we set the highest of standards that we're doing. The good example would be is in Chicago, we just finished debating about whether or not an officer should report if they document a pointing of a firearm. Right? Mm -hmm. That's a basic accountability. We like to know how many times I would, as a police chief, my officers will point a fire, fire gun, in your, your, uh, gun in your face. That met with some initial resistance, but that's the kind of accountability that you check everything, how they're talking to people, how they're engaging, why they're doing stops, the disparity in the stops. There's a lot we can do before it gets to this outstanding DA that has to make criminal charges. If it's criminal, he takes over. If it's not, it's not either you know, all of us. It should be something in between. I think, uh, <clears throat> Shari, you're looking for somebody to say, well, <laughs> let's see if we can apply the Sentinel Events model where we can bring all the stakeholders to the table and develop a, a just culture system where we can talk about it. And I think that's great. Uh, but you know who's not on this panel, and I haven't seen any representatives here uh, so far at this actually terrific conference. Where are the unions, right? Uh, 
I know it's police unions that mm -hmm. uh, uh, I respect unions. Uh, I was raised to respect unions. I was started a legal aid union <laughs> years ago. Um, but uh, you know, there are difficulties. Uh, years ago, uh, in the uh, Abner Louima case, uh, our uh, civil rights firm uh, with Johnny Cochran, we sued uh, on behalf of Abner, not just the city of New York, we mm -hmm. sued the Patrolman's Benevolent Association mm -hmm. um, uh, because they all sat around with the representatives and they created a cover story. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, that was true and, you know, they paid money, but it wasn't the money. We actually got some injunctive relief. Uh, because what uh, uh, my friend Johnny Cochran always used to say, we don't want uh, the good police officers to be afraid of the bad ones. Mm -hmm. um, and so we got a provision where officers could get their own separate PBA lawyers, right, uh, 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 around these uh, incidents. And I, I think that's very important. Uh, last point I want to make is uh, uh, Eric talked about the indictment in Brooklyn. There was also a conviction of this officer, I'll mispronounce his name, Desmoreau in Queens, who was actually an officer that the legal aid database had tracked because he had wha he, he had a lot of overtime, right? And they actually get that as a public record here in New York. It's in the database. Overtime is a good tell as to who you should watch. Uh, but in any event, they caught him uh, claiming that he was in a bodega uh, and he saw a drug sale go down, and it turned out that there was a, a videotape in the bodega, and there was no drug sale, hand-to-hand -hand drug sale. And so plainly the police report that he filled out was false, and he was indicted in Queens, right? Uh, and his lawyer uh, got up from the police union and said, this was just a little white lie, right? <laughs> because the guy, you know, they claimed had drugs on him anyhow. Uh, when they arrested him later. Uh, this was just a little white lie. And if you are going to bring charges in all cases like this, we're gonna have to have the whole police force in here, right? And he meant it. The funny thing about it is that now in the era of big data, where we can actually keep track of everybody, what they say, when they say it, uh, <clears throat> and have all this right on a cell phone that the district attorneys and the defenders and the judge can then know about it. Uh, we really are on the verge of ending test lying to a large degree, right? Um, and that will, if that is enforced, I truly believe that the police are gonna respond appropriately because people didn't go, they don't go into policing uh, because they want to break the law. They go into policing because they want to protect the community and uphold the law. And if it becomes clear that you will get caught if you lie on a police report, right? If you said, oh, uh, uh, I know you have your day off. Well, I'm going to say I actually took the drugs or took the guns, right? If that becomes clear that you can get in trouble for not telling the truth, that is going to do a lot for people people in the community having confidence in the police and having confidence in the DAs and having confidence in the whole system. And we can actually do that if we're serious. I, I, I think that um, the community wants the police to pay. The police to pay, what I mean is when, like if you do a crime, you lose time from your job, you could get fired from your job because you didn't go to work and the police get paid even if they do a crime. So I think that should stop right there. They shouldn't get paid into proving is innocent. I mean, that opinion, not mine, our yeah. opinion. Um, another thing that, that a lot of the mothers say, that the police, why do taxpayers gotta pay the lawsuit? It should be come from the PBA, from the union, of, you know, from the PBA. Um, because it's their police officers that they protect. And that's another thing. And uh, the mothers say that um, if they do the crime, they should do the time. That's it. Thank you. Famous last words. Um, so I was getting the hand signal that, uh, are we moving to Q&A now? Is that, yeah. So uh, we'd love to open it up for questions from the audience. We've got another 30 minutes, I think, for that.
Yeah. A lot of the discussion was, as, uh, as was mentioned, kind of on the back end after uh, the misconduct and how do we improve the, the criminal justice system, the disciplinary system. But we did at least raise the issue of, all right, how do you get community in on the front end? So I'm wondering if some of you can talk about you know, what kinds of recommendations do you have to a police chief, to a community, in order to get the community involved at the front end on um, uh, the tactics issues, the strategies, whether you use aggressive saturation patrol, jump outs, or we're going to go for more data and uh, problem solving, that sort of thing. If you don't mind, I'll start. A couple, uh, maybe just real quick. The first one is make sure you define a community properly. And a community is not just a group that agrees with you. It would be the group that probably disagrees with you the most. It has to be inclusive of that. The second part is most departments on either, either an annual or every couple of years, if they're, have, if they're doing it right, will have to redo their policies anyway. Get them updated, get them reviewed for legal uh, compliance. That's the opportunity, is that when you're renewing your policies, is to be able to sit down and put together a group with the community, talk about the policy, post it online. The open data is also huge, so people can weigh in and you can factor that in. When you're developing training, the same thing. If you're gonna train on mental illness, if you're gonna train on reentry, if you're gonna change on substance abuse, having people that are mostly impacted or affected, we learned this morning, then they should be inside the academy teaching the students about what it's really like and what, how to engage and how to respect the challenges and the nuances and not just sending an officer to a trainer trainer and coming back speaking for a segment of the community. So there's immediate opportunities once the chief says I want to engage, he or she can start by saying let's redo the policies and you can pick the ones that affect the community the most. You can do a reevaluation of your training and if you're going to focus on cultural competency, use of force, uh, crisis intervention, right, on, on how to deal and interact with communities that have been historically disenfranchised, ranging from African American to LGBTQ. There's all kinds of ways and opportunities to engage the community once that expert or once that chief or department says it wants to do that. And I agree with you, that's on the front end. What ends up happening is, to your point, is that doesn't occur until the video comes out and then it's on the back end while you're in a crisis and you're trying to establish a relationship well beyond the likelihood of it occurring. Imagine if you started now, you actually started revamping your policies, you engage in developing training, you have people coming into your academy, they're coming in and out of your police department like they own it, because literally they do, and then you have a crisis, you have something to work with. Randy? I agree with all of it. What I think would be neat is to see a, a, a police department put together a group of stakeholders, and like Ron said, that's not everybody that just agrees with you, because they're, those studies that Policing Project has done have shown that a lot of times part of the reason the uh, community doesn't get involved in law enforcement is that unlike a lot of other professions, there's experts in those professions, but in the community, they kind of defer to the expertise of the police officer. Just, the community just doesn't have that expertise and they just kind of let it go, so they, they don't get engaged in policy development. But what I, what I would love to see is exactly what Ron's saying where we get together these stakeholders and this could take the better part of a year, if you've ever seen a police uh, policy book, they're pretty lengthy, <laughs> and actually go through the whole thing. Go through the whole thing with these, with these stakeholders and get their input and explain to them, if, if there's a disagreement, have that conversation about, well, well, this is why we do it this way. Maybe the only reason we do it this way is because that's the way we always did it. And maybe the, the community's perspective on it will change the department's mind as well. Um, but on the flip side, if there's a real reason that it's been done, then the community has the opportunity then to understand that rather than to just be kind of told this is how it is. Um, but I, I, I agree, I think that would be neat to see a policy book that was done by the community and the police department together. One cautionary tale for the police chiefs in the room. Community engagement does not result in community co-opting. And if you're going to bring somebody to the table, that means they're entitled to agree and they're absolutely entitled to disagree. And you can't put your thumb in your mouth like a little baby when they walk out and publicly disagree. <laughs> As I got to go keep going to my, my hero over here, my shero over here, put on the big pants and handle it. Right? Part of working with the community is that people are going to disagree and you have to respect that. Too many chiefs figure this because you met with me now, 
that you're supposed to be the one on a microphone constantly yelling and, and, and genuflecting every time the police department does something, whether good or bad. To me, a real relationship is that you know, I know your expectation of me. So in fact, the fact that you met me 10 times should tell me one thing is, if he hears me say this, that's the first person I'm gonna hear from saying you're full of you know what, or the person that says, don't you bring your butt back to this temple until you do it. But we also, we, too often we try to force people to, well, since I met with you, that means you're now, you've been co-opted, and that's why a lot of groups refuse to meet with the police department and so they see real meaningful change. I also think that um, if communities advocate, you know, for, for me, one of the things that I heard a lot about was the way we were dealing with uh, drug use and drug misuse in our communities. And so one of the very first things that I did as the DA is change the enforcement practice of my office as it relates to low level possession of any drug, uh, including narcotics, um, that I was no longer going to prosecute low level offenders. Um, we created a program, Brooklyn Clear, independently got the money to fund that through the city council um, and then later on through the mayor's office. But this program that said when the police make an arrest for someone who's going through an addiction issue, is, is suffering for, from drug misuse, um, instead of arresting them and then my office spending the resources, writing up the case, sending them central booking, arraigning them and then dealing with the case, that we worked with uh, you know, EAC Link in this particular case to send out peer counselors right to the precinct no matter what time of day or night um, and tell the person that the DA would give you a chance to go directly to get help and assist in social services or drug rehabilitation and not come and enter the criminal justice system in the first place. So I think that there isn't the ability to impact change by um, the community coming together because initially, um, you know, this took some time to get police buy-in on, right? To say that the police were going to release them right at the precinct level um, with a DAT and, and really no future court date depending on the fact that they were going to go and try to get treatment. And the way the program works in Brooklyn is the peer counsel has seven days to work with the person who's been now arrested but never charged to get the services that they need. If they get, if they go into that um, program and it's not always uh, drug rehabilitation, sometimes it's just other services that they may need, I will monitor that they are participating for about 30 days. And if they are substantially participating, then I will never bring that charge. They will never come through the criminal justice system and we'll keep addressing their needs. So I think that's a way of talking about how we want the community to be involved in changing law enforcement practice. And that's what we've done now in Brooklyn. You're, you're hearing a lot of really awesome policies from a really good DA come forward. But one cautionary note on that. What he's doing is excellent because it's giving us a baseline to establish best practices. But anytime we, we do, we, we have where it's not set in statute or policy, it's always one election away from reverting to what it was or changing completely. So that, that's just a cautionary note on, on that is, is that when you see something like that, somebody doing that, supporting that and getting that more engraved in stone, whether it's state statute or, or more official policy, to, uh, because now we have something we can look at, right? Politicians don't like to take the risk. They don't want to take the, the, the experiment, but he's doing it. So when it turns out well, then they have something to look at and we can put this in stone so that it doesn't, it's not flipping back and forth every time there's an election or the policy changes. Again, it, you know, it can be one election away from changing. Two quickies. The first one, which is my second thought, was about the, uh, around the choice of stakeholders. That is a very, um, it's a big problem in many communities. It is the usual suspects that are the stakeholders uh, about healthcare, they're the same stakeholders for community policing, they're the same stakeholders for what happens in the park. And so, and I know that, because I'm often one of those usual suspects. And then I walk in the room and I say, why am I here? Or uh, why is this the same group from a month ago or two months ago? And the topic 
bears no resemblance to what is being discussed. I stay because I want to hear what is being advanced. I'm not one, to, and I'm not one to say yes because I feel so good that I was invited. It is not who I am, but just a lot of work has to be done about that because people get crowned as stakeholders, either because they are generous around campaign contributions or or they say what they're told to say. So just a cautionary, talking of cautionary tales. <clears throat> the question that I had first is about pensions and benefits and all of that. Back to Mrs. Bice. I am not clear <coughs> what allows, after someone is found guilty in a court of law, to hang on to a pension. And I'm sure it's not everything. But I have that conversation with people in, in the neighborhood all the time, you know, after, after each case that pops up. How do, get, how do they stay entitled to that? That's our money. And the unions are definitely, ha you know, a part of that. That's something I am, I'm assuming was negotiated somewhere. How, what do we do about that? That if you, you know, paying the price, doing the, doing the time, it's not just doing the time. It's your pocket pays the price. And you have to think that your kids are going to pay the price and your wife is going to pay the price. And maybe that's an incentive to think twice before you do something. Um, in my case, we stopped uh, Lavoti's pension. He needed, I think, two days to be qualified. If you do 15 years, you qualify for your pension. Regardless if you're guilty or, or innocent, you got your pension. So um, they do give it to them after 15 years in the service. That's what I was told. They, that, that's why um, we stopped it two days before he got it. And we could, you know, we, we could have stopped it, and we did. But a lot of parents don't know that, so they don't put in the paperwork. And then it's real that of the police officers have 15 years already, uh, because the old ones don't bother with guns anymore. They just want to hurry up their five years and get out. But the ones that are young, they are the ones that play with the guns. And that's why you have to, the, your lawyer has to put in the paperwork to stop the pension. Yeah, you need to, each state's going to be different. So some places you're vested at five years, you can't retire to a certain age. And what you got to look at of a pension is, is you got to look at that as any proprietary right that you would have. A person that gets arrested and convicted doesn't automatically lose their house unless you sue them for that asset. And so most cases you're going to have to do a separate action. I would imagine a separate civil action to go against someone that it's, that they have paid into for 25 or 30 years, it'd be no different than if I paid into my house and got convicted. I don't automatically lose my house unless you sue me and you take the house. So there are some states you have to take up the law. Some will allow the department to stop the, the retirement based on misconduct and character unbecoming. Some require civil, some civil process. So you have to take a look at it because it's, it's all over the map. I just don't know any place that is, to your point, that it's automatic. And so we've had a place when I was in Oakland that there was a debate about a guy that was convicted of murdering his wife and then basically rode on a car, uh, kill cops. So, so everybody thought it was a cop killer or killing a family and it turned out it was him. And I think he might have received this pension for a while if he's still not receiving it. Why is it? I think they might have finally taken it. that they've put sure. into it, but that the rest of us don't have to be slapped in the face with having to pay because it's not about what you put in, it's right. everything else from the that's, pool. That's exactly right. I, I just think that it's- That is like insult added to injury. Nope, I just maybe bears it away. And I, I think it can be done, I just don't think it's an automatic process. In other words, I would look at it as, as that this person has a certain proprietary right, part of the deal they cut by working, and they're gonna say, your contribution to my retirement wasn't a gift. It was the fact that I worked 30 years and you paid me a little as you did. I accepted this amount knowing that I would get this amount with my retirement. And I own that. And for you to take it is a, probably a separate action. Now, quite frankly, if I do something like that, you should take it. I just don't think it's automatic. I don't know if you need to run away. No, I, <clears throat> I look at it from the point of view of a plaintiff's lawyer. Uh, 
I'd rather see the municipality pay than take somebody's pension when they have uh, a family and uh, kids and everybody else depending on it, you know. Uh, uh, while sometimes one could try to take it, you know, uh, the better part of justice is is no. And uh, I, you know, I mean, we, if we're talking about restorative justice, I, uh, 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 I think we've got to get the unions in the room. <laughs>